All right, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. All right, good afternoon. Why is the glory be to God kind of like glory be to God? Good afternoon. There you go, amen. All right, I am excited. Uh, one correction, um, and I don't know if Lydia is trying to hint something, but this is week four. We st I still got one more week. Uh, you guys can't get rid of me that easily, so... Uh, we still got one more week, so next week uh, we'll wrap up this series. So again, uh, welcome. Uh, glad everybody's here. Um, and we started this journey, with, this is week four, so with three weeks ago. And we've been talking about climbing a ladder. Um, and we're talking about, you know, during this fast, and I've been saying this every week, and hopefully you guys are kind of getting it, that we're not going to just go through this fast with a diet, but we're going to expect us to be different. Our spiritual life, the virtues that we pick up, we're going to be different than we started. Because God promises that nothing can be done without fasting and praying. And I hope all of us have been praying. Again, this is week six uh, or seven. You know, I lost count. But we only have about three more weeks. We got two more weeks. Um, and then the last week being Holy Week. And one thing I want to say, Holy Week is coming up. If you've never done Holy Week, if you don't know what Holy Week is, like Holy Week if you had to fast, if you had to give up anything, if you had to do anything like to God, Holy Week, that's your week. If you can't give God like, okay, I can't fast 55 days. I can't read my Bible. Like, but Holy Week, that's like one week where we dedicate our life to God. I heard a sermon maybe eight, ten years ago. And the sermon was about Holy Week. And he said, take a week off. I know for those of you guys taking a week off, that's hard. We take a vacation because we need to, like, you know, get away from our day-to-day, -day, and we take a vacation. But during the sermon, the preacher said, take a week off during Holy Week and dedicate that time with God. Treat that as like a vacation with God. So as hard as it was to give up my 40 hours of work, like leave, to take a week off, I did it, you know, when I first did it, I'm telling you, that week, I felt like you told me, Kala, walk on water, I felt like I could walk on water. Because... You wake up in the morning, you're like with God. Like at night, there was service, I'm with God. Like, er, like my ho the whole week was God. I, my phone was off, like I wasn't reading anything, I wasn't watching anything. That week was dedicated to being with God. Unfortunately, we can't do that, you know, throughout the year. We have life, I get it. But one week, I'm telling you guys, if you're able to take some time off, whether it's a full week, maybe you can't do a full week. Maybe it's just third Friday. Maybe it's Thursday and Friday right? So whatever hours that you're able to take off, and I understand as parents, we have lots of responsibilities, but I'm saying this now so you can kind of plan ahead, all right? So I challenge you guys, again, we're going to have service here on Thursdays and Fridays. We're also going to have virtual service Monday through Wednesday. Um, so I hope that you guys are able to join. So I encourage you guys, if you've never taken Holy Week off, like, take, give God eight hours of your leave. Like, you know what, I'm going to take leave, I'm going to come to church on Thursday. I'm going to come to church on Friday, all right? So that's my challenge to you guys. All right, with that being said, let's jump into our series, our journey. And we've been talking about climbing a ladder, and it's based um, off a book by Father John Mack. And it's about 30 different virtues that he talks about and climbing a ladder to holiness. That's why we said it's pursuit of holiness. So it's our climb to get closer to God. And that's what this Lent season is about. That's what our life as Christians, our journey, that's what it's all about. It's about us getting closer to God. And even though there are 30 virtues in this book, we've been talking about five different virtues. Well, you know, three, but we'll talk about the fourth one today. But I encourage you to get the book. It's called Ascending the Heights. Um, it's an amazing book. It's very short. Uh, it has a lot of great virtues. So again, uh, it's written to monks, but just because it's written to monks doesn't mean that we, can, uh, we can't apply it to our lives. Just like every week, we've been talking about the same verse, right? What is our main verse, our theme verse for this journey? What book? Shout it out if you guys remember. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. All right, let's all read it together. Until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That should be our goal, not just for this land, but us Christians. 
is to be knowledge of God. And we've been talking about this for the past two weeks. Knowledge isn't just knowing somebody, but an intimate relationship. It's about a relationship. And the first week, we, took, we talked about liturgical worship. Liturgical worship. And how we say liturgical worship is biblical worship, right? Um, and then we also say liturgical worship is heavenly. That when we walk through these doors, liturgy is we're walking into heaven. Because just like the angels are praising God, that's how we're praising them. So we're amongst the angels and praising God, right? And we said attending liturgy isn't the goal. It's great that we come to liturgy. It's great that it's packed. But ultimately, the knowledge of God, what St. Paul is telling us, is Christ in us, right? It's communion. And that's why we do liturgy here every Sunday. It isn't just for us to come and watch, be a spectator, but it's also for us to participate. And then we talked about repentance last week. And a lot of times people use the word repentance and confession like they're the same thing. And we looked at last week, they're completely different. Repentance is something that we do daily. It's a daily cry to God to change our lives. It's a daily cry to God to have mercy on us. It's a daily cry to God saying, I have fallen. Have mercy on me. It's us wanting to change direction. That's repentance. But then after repentance is when we go to a priest and we confess and we saw how the priest, they're ordained by God. Don't ever think when you go to confession, you're confessing to a person, to a priest. You're confessing to God through a priest because that's who God chose as his vehicle. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, he was on earth. He was healing people. He was forgiven sins. But when he left, he, he breathed on the apostles and gave them the authority to forgive sins. So when you go to the confession room, when you see a priest, that's, you, you, you might see a priest, but you're confessing to Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ just uses the vehicle, which is the priest, uh, to forgive us of our sins. So that was the first goal, the knowledge of God. And today we're going to transition to the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is Christ like? If we, like our goal, just as Christ told me, we started this fast saying, Kiddus, be holy. God said, be holy as I am holy. Our life is to be like Christ, to walk like Christ, to love like Christ. And today, we're going to talk about a virtue of Christ. And one of those virtues that we're going to cover today is obedience. Obedience isn't something that we as adults like to talk about, but we want our kids to obey, don't we? Right? We want our children. We want the young. Like, that's what we should teach Sunday school. We, we like to talk about praying, about fasting, you know, about you know, anything except obedience isn't a virtue that we strive for, isn't a virtue that we typically talk about, because obedience is like you tell kids to obey. But if we want to obey, if we want to be like Christ, he was obedient to the Father when he was here, all the way to the cross. So if you want to be like Christ, one of the virtues that we must have is be obedient. Before we get started, what does it mean to be obedient? As soon as I hear this, as soon as I say the word obedient, we think of, you know, kind of giving our life to somebody. We think of following rules. We think of, you know, somebody telling us something to do and we have to do it. I would say obedience is more about a person, about our relationship with a person. That's why the first two weeks we focused on a relationship. That's why we focused on Christ in us about building that relationship, not just knowing about Christ, but that relationship. If we think of obedience, of a person, of a relationship, obeying to that person won't be that hard. Our key message for today is obedience reveals our relationship with the person given the command, not just the commandment itself. I'll say it again. Obedience reveals our relationship with the person given the command, not just the commandment itself. Obedience is more about a person giving the command versus following just a bunch of rules. Obedience is more about trusting a person versus rules. I'll give you guys an example. If we walk out these doors and somebody tells you to do something, somebody that you don't know, somebody that you don't have a relationship with versus somebody that you love, somebody that you trust, 
somebody that you have a close relationship, who would we listen to? We listen to the person that we have a relationship with. Obedience is more about the person versus the commandment itself. We as Christians, we believe that God wants the best for us. We believe that. That's why we are in the church. That's why we do the things that we do. That's why we fast. God is a loving father. He doesn't want us to, so to, to suffer. He's not a God that wants to, us to suffer. He wants the best for his children. Just any parents, ask any parent. They want the best for their kids. More than the kids want the best for themselves. Our father is no different. That does not mean he gives us everything we want. Just because he wants the best for us doesn't mean he answers all our prayers. My relationship with my daughter, Johanna, she's three years old. She would love to wake up and have ice cream for breakfast. But I say no because I know that's not good for her. So just the same way our father, like not everything that we want is good for us. So it doesn't mean he gives us everything. But I truly believe that God wants to bless us more than we want to be blessed. He wants to bless your family. He wants to bless your kids your career, your relationship, your school. But obedience is the means of how God wants to bless our life. Obedience is the way that God wants to bless our life. The path to get this blessing is obedience. If we want God's blessing, we must obey. Again, not just because of what the commandments are, it's that the relationship. If we truly believe he wants the best for us, if we truly have faith in God that he wants to take care of his children, and if we truly believe that he died for you and I, we must believe that it doesn't matter what he tells me, I will obey. Because I truly trust on that person that said, do th it doesn't matter what he tells me to do, but I will obey. <clears throat> Every day, multiple times a day, we face this decision. Do I obey or do I not? Do I follow God or my logic? Do I follow God or my selfish desires? Think of obedience as a partnership, a divine partnership. There's God, he does his part, and I do my part. When it comes to obedience, don't focus on the rules. But focus on, like, there's a relationship. He tells me to do this, but I fully trust that he will deliver that blessing if I obey. We're going to look at a story about St. Peter. We're going to look at about a story in St. Peter in the book of Acts, chapter 5. But before we get there, um, yesterday was actually the monthly commemoration of St. Peter and St. Paul. Um, so I figured it might be fitting for us to look at the life of St. Peter. I know we've done a whole series on St. Paul, so uh, we're going to look at St. Peter today. When it comes to obedience, we're going to look at his story, and we're going to see what can we learn from St. Peter. Before we get into chapter 5, let's do a recap of the first four chapters, and I'll go through them very quickly, of the book of Acts. So chapter 1 in the book of Acts, so the book of Acts is about the history of the church, how the church started. So chapter 1 starts with Christ coming back after his resurrection. He comes back and spends 40 days with his disciples, with his apostles, and teaching them how to establish the church, how to run the church. And this is what he tells them. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. There goes the commandment to St. Peter and the apostles. Be a witness of me. You're going to spread Christianity. You're going to teach people about Christ, about Christianity. You're going to baptize people. Be a witness. That's their command. Let's go to chapter 2. So chapter 1, he gives them a command, and he leaves. He ascends. And then they receive the Holy Spirit in chapter 2. Pentecost. That's why we celebrate Pentecost. So they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, all of a sudden, St. Peter, the same person that was scared of a little girl during his Holy Week, during the last week of Christ, is now standing in front of 3,000 people and preaching about the Word of God. 
He's preaching to 3,000 people, obeying based on what God commanded him in chapter 1. Chapter 3, St. Peter and John, St. John, they're walking. They see a man that can't walk. They heal him. They continue to preach. They continue to evangelize. They continue to heal people. At this point, they have a huge follower. They're obeying. They're doing what God had commanded them to do. And then we get into chapter 4. St. Peter is being obedient. God told him to be a witness. He's been doing that for the last several chapters. And we pick up our stories here. Now, as they spoke to the people, talking about St. Peter and the apostles, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on, hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Congrats, St. Peter. Way to obey. You Now you're in prison, captured. Way to be obedient. What do you think St. Peter does? God told him to obey. He's been obeying. And then he ends up in prison. What do you think St. Peter does next? He's arrested in chapter 4. Eventually he's beaten and released. And then we transition to chapter 5. He's released. What do you guys think he does next? Pick up our story. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done to, uh, among the people. And believers, believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. St. Peter, he was just in jail, beaten, released, continues to obey. Continues to obey the person that gave him the command. Like, I read this story, and I say, like, why? Like, you obeyed for a few chapters, but then you went to prison for it. Why go back right after that and go ahead and preach and heal people? St. Peter, the same person that denied Christ three times, and Christ told him he would deny him, all of a sudden, low, no limit to his being obedient to Christ. Why? And I'll keep saying this. Obedience is not to a rule. It's not to just anybody. It's to a person. And St. Peter understood this. We don't obey everybody. But St. Peter figured obedience to God doesn't matter what he tells me to do. Again, even though he was with Christ and saw all the miracles, he wasn't really sure. St. Peter initially, he denied Christ. But then... He saw him beaten, Christ, crucified, nailed on the cross, and then he died, and then he resurrected. And it was after that, St. Peter said, I'm going with that guy. I'm going to put my faith in that person. Question for us is, is that the same person that we believe in? The same person that died for you and I? The same person that resurrected? that predicted his death and his resurrection. Is that the same person that we have faith and trust in? That's who St. Peter was being obedient to. It doesn't matter whether he was in prison. He was given a command. No matter what happened to him, we see him continuing to obey. Our first lesson from St. Peter is that as Christians, we must embrace opposition as a result of your obedience. Embrace opposition as a result of your obedience. Anyone that obeys God, when you obey God, you will have an opposition. And it could be your family member, it could be your mom, it could be your dad. It could be people inside the church. That's who's giving St. Peter a problem. The Jewish council. It could be your friend. But as Christians, when you obey, don't think life is going to be great. But expect and embrace opposition. What do you think happened to St. Peter? He's in prison in chapter 4. He's in released. And then chapter 5, he's preaching again. Let's pick up our story. 
Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Back to prison for the second time in two chapters. You can't expect that when you obey God that everything will be okay. The more we obey, the more you are obedient to God, the more people that will oppose you. What was their crime? What was St. Peter's crime for being put in prison? Obedience. Think about St. Peter's wife. Think about her prayer that night when he was put in jail. God, you are good to those that obey you. Everybody should obey my husband. He's been in prison twice. Imagine her prayer. My daughter, she's three years old. And she's in this phase where she says, it's not fair. She's three. Everything is not fair. She doesn't get what it's not fair. I think we would say the same thing here. It's not fair. He's obeying what God had told him to do. But he's prison. Not once. Twice. He's been beaten. In a small, um, short of period of time. A lot of times, we think obeying God means my life is easy. I should have no tribulations. My life should be smooth. I should get the job that I want. I should get the girl that I want, the boy that, like, I'm obeying. I'm coming to church. I'm fasting. And we think God owes us. That's not obedience. That's negotiation. I do this and you do that, God. God didn't promise that we would have an easy life. Instead, he promised the complete opposite. In the book of John, chapter 16, verse 33, Christ tells us, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God didn't promise an easy life, but he did say that we must obey. He wants us to be obedient. St. Peter, his life wasn't easy, but he continued to obey. Why? Because of the person. The person that died for you and I, who resurrected, and who said he was coming back again to save us. That's who he was obedient to. I would say, if you're not ready to face opposition, I don't think we'll be ready for God to use us. If we're not ready to face opposition because we're obedient to God, we're not ready for God to use us. We're not ready for God to use us. No way that we're going to try to do something for the kingdom of God and the devil won't do anything. No way that any of us here will try to do something for the kingdom of God and have an easy life. A story of this church. God has done amazing thing to a lot of people here, to this church. And I'm only talking from experience. I'm not talking about this specific church, but you could talk about even the church in general. Less than a year, we've seen miracles. If you talk to people, like sometimes we want like a big miracle. We want like somebody to walk on water or like something to just come out of note. Like, but if you talk to people, which I have been fortunate to do so, You'll hear miracles after miracles. As I was preparing this, somebody sends me a text about a story, and I won't say the person's name, but she had a prayer from 2015. I'm going to read her prayer, and we're going to talk about it. Background story. So, she, you know, she didn't, send us the, she didn't send me the full prayer, but it's a beautiful story about a girl she was in college being obedient in college, going to church. There was no Ethiopian church, so she went to a Coptic church, right? She's in college. She's going to Coptic church, right? And she's journaling to God. She's writing God a prayer. This is in 2015. And this is what she writes, talking about the Coptic church. They have so many people their age and understand each other on many levels. The amount of people and supporters at George's graduation and somebody's engagement um, random people, I guess her friends. It's honestly something so beautiful and something I am so incredibly jealous of because I can't name 
a single fellow Ethiopian Orthodox follower that I'm not related to, who is my age, that I can share my struggle with, let alone an entire community of them. It's kind of torture, and I don't know what God's doing with that. That was her prayer in 2015. And now look at this, what God has given her. God is a big God. As beautiful as that is, the miracles, don't for one thing, this church came out of nowhere, that we didn't face opposition, that it wasn't hard, that people didn't have to go through what they went through. When this mission started in 2014, a lot of opposition. People will say, English? You're going to teach in English? You're going to sing Mesbud in English? Nobody will come. That's not God's language. This was in 2014. The amount of opposition. And some of you guys know, I don't have to, the comments, you know, social media, whatever it is, the videos that you, people have seen, it wasn't always easy. But just like St. Peter, we can't expect to obey and not face opposition. St. Peter's life wasn't easy. He went to prison. Maybe you're not going to prison, but maybe you're losing friends when you obey. Maybe you're losing a lot of friends when we obey God. Maybe it's an argument with your prayer because you're obeying God. When you take holy communion, I've talked to people. When you try to do the right thing, somebody will tell you, you shouldn't. We should embrace opposition because that's what God wants to use. When you face opposition, this should be encouraging. This means you're doing the right thing. When you face opposition for following God, being obedient, being in the church, this should be encouraging. As hard as the enemy is working, you know who else is working hard? God. Which brings me to my next point. Obedience unlocks God's power and blessing. We just read this story, but I want to show it again. This is verses 17 to 18. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with, uh, with him talked about St. Peter, and they were filled with the indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. They were in prison. Verse 18. What do you think happened in verse 19? Let's read. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. As hard as the enemy is working, we got to believe God is working harder. As hard as the enemy is working, our God is so big, and he's working harder than the enemy. No transition between verse 18 and 19. Verse 18, they're in prison. St. Luke, the way he writes, he's like, oh yeah, an angel of the Lord came and he let them out. Why? They expect these things. It's not a surprise to them. I read this and I'm like, whoa! Like, like immediately. Verse 18, prison. 19, the angel of the Lord. For the apostles, this wasn't a surprise to them. That when they face opposition, they have a big God who died and resurrected. He can do all things. They're not worried about people. St. Peter understood that he obeys a big God. He's been obeying. He's been put in prison. But we see God working. We see God continuing to work. Why? Because obedience is more about the person giving the commandment. Obedience, our key message, is, is more about the commandment, not the rules. It's not, sometimes we look at obedience like, do I have to follow all the rules? Follow the person. Forget the rules. Follow the person, and the rules will mean nothing. Because he tells you to preach, you'll go. He said, you might, be you might be persecuted. You'll go. It doesn't matter. Look what God promises for those who obey him. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 9, I broke it up, but we're going to see like the, the, when we obey, the blessing of God. And the blessing that he has promised us. Now it shall come to pass, as you cross the Jordan to the land the Lord uh, your God gives you, 
if you dilig diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to be careful and do all his commandments I command you today then the Lord your God will set you high over all the nations of the earth then all these blessings shall come upon you and find you why because you obey the voice of the Lord your God the condition for the blessing is our obedience to God it keeps going so what are these blessings blessed shall you be in the city and blessed and blessed shall you be in the country blessed shall be the offspring of your womb and the produce of your grounds and the herds of your oxen and the flocks of your sheep blessed shall be your storehouses and your reserves blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out i don't know what the last person when you go in and out but i'm pretty sure talking about i will bless you when you go outside of the house when you go inside the house i will bless you but the condition is that we must obey it keeps going and includes here the lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and all to which you set your hand in the land the lord your god gives you the lord your god will establish you as a holy people to himself in the manner he swore to your fathers if you obey the voice of the lord your god and walk in his ways because we obeyed god has a blessing if this does not get you pumped up to obey this person and jesus christ who has given us this promise i don't know what will get you pumped up to follow that person and obey question for you question for us what blessing are we leaving on the table because of our disobedience what is god asking you to obey what is god asking you to obey maybe it's the commandment to forgive maybe it's to forgive a friend that's hurt you real bad that has done you wrong maybe it's to forgive your mom or your dad that wasn't there for you when you were young maybe the commandment is to love your enemies just as christ prayed for those that are persecuting him maybe the commandment is for us to be pure even when everybody around us isn't so pure maybe it's to love our neighbors maybe it's to give maybe your time maybe it's to give tithing money what commandment is god asking us to obey because he's promised us blessings after blessings but the condition is that we must obey again god has all these promises for us he has all these blessings for us but obedience is the means that god wants to bless our life wants to bless our kids maybe can you imagine if one person in the household obeys god and the blessing that god will do for that household that's what he told abraham one person i will bless your house i will bless your family that's our second uh, lesson finally our last lesson is that obedience is the evidence of our trust and our faith in God obedience is the evidence of our trust and faith in God I love if you've never read the book of James it's like one of my favorite books to read he's very straightforward a lot of times we say I have faith St. James said, show me your faith by your works. If people was to see us and how we live our life, can they say, that person follows God? That person is a Christian. St. Peter, he's crazy. He's been in jail, what, two times already. But he keeps going. He keeps preaching. He keeps obeying God. Why? Because it's faith and trust in God. If somebody was to see us, and see our life and the way we live can they tell that we are a follower of christ that we are a christian that we have a big faith and that we have a big god or can they say you know what their problem is bigger than their god a lot of times we look at our problem and make it bigger than the god that we serve obedience to god is the evidence of our faith and our trust in god 
We just saw the power of God. An angel came and opened the door. And he freed them. They've been in jail twice. What do you think the angel tells St. Peter? Verse 19. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple, and speak to the people. Another word, go preach. Go be a witness. The same commandment Christ gave them in chapter 1. All the words of his life. How would you respond? At this point, St. Peter has done a lot. He's served, he's preached, he's baptized 3,000 people. He's been in prison twice. God will understand. Like, let's think about it. Let's, you know, let's reconsider this. Logic will say, no. Don't do it, don't obey. Faith and trust in God, keep preaching. Obey. And look at what St. Peter does the next verse. Verse 21. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. They obeyed immediately. They woke up and did it. They went to the, like they've been in prison twice. You know, if that was us, you know what we would have said? Let's pray and fast about it. Meaning like, let's not do it. St. Peter, his faith, his trust in God was big. Before Pentecost, that's the same person he ran away when people were saying, do you know Christ? But after he received the Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit that we receive, his boldness, his faith, his trust, and the same God that we worship. One of my siblings is very famous for saying, like, we're, when we grew up, our parents would tell us to do something. He always said, like, I'll do it later. He's always, I'll do it later. I won't say which one. I feel like that would have been us in this story. Like, let's reconsider. Like, let the people, like, calm down. We've just been in prison twice. Now you tell me to go preach again. Let's, you know, let's reconsider. Let's go have a conversation with them. Let's do it later. St. Peter obeyed immediately. Again, why? It's more about the person versus the commandment. It's not about the command, but he trusted and he had faith in that person. Like, like James said, show me your faith through your works. King Solomon tells us in the book of Proverbs, he said, trust in God with all your heart and do not exalt your own wisdom. God wants us to trust him, even if logically makes no sense to us. God wants us to have faith in him. And that's what King Solomon is telling us here. Trust God, not our own understanding. Logically, it made, it made no sense for them to go back. I would agree. Logically, like, they just want to pray. God will understand. They've done enough already. Think about St. Moses. God tells him, go stretch your hands and the sea will part. Logically, that made no sense to Moses. But he obeyed. And that's why we talk about St. Moses, because of his obedience. Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, an angel comes to her, say, you will bear a son. Logically, she's a virgin. Virgins don't give birth. Made no sense, but she obeyed. And that's why she's called the Mother of God, as a result of her obedience. Going back to St. Peter, like, why obey? Reconsider. Ask yourself, what is God asking you to trust him in? What is God asking you to trust him in? What is God, like, we say we want to increase our faith. This is the way God tests us our faith, where our faith is. Same way he tested Abraham when he told him to offer his son. He didn't just say his son. He said, your only son, the only son that I gave you, to see where his faith was. So what is God asking us to trust him in? What is God asking us to have faith in him? And what? Is it our friendship? 
Is it the way we date? Is it in our finances? Is it in our career? We have no idea what God can do in a small obedience. I'm not saying we're going to obey everything. That's why we talked about repentance. That's why we talked about confession last week. One small act of obedience. Try God. That's what he said. He said, try me. Trust him. Have faith in him. We'll conclude the story here. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, and they feared the people lest they should be stoned. And the high priest asked them, saying, Do we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intended to bring the man's blood on us. They're back in prison for the third time. Over two chapters, they continue to obey. People are mad. People are upset. You know what St. Peter says at the end? But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's obedience. We rather obey God than anybody else. Obedience to God is what will determine our faith and our trust in God. God has the blessings on blessings for us and he's promised us. Condition is that we obey. Condition is that we follow. It's more about the relationship. That's why I feel like the first two uh, part of the series is about the, our relationship. We won't trust somebody that we don't have a relationship with. We won't trust somebody that we just come here on Sundays and do liturgy and go home. That's not a relationship. My wife, we have a relationship. We see and talk to each other. We live, like, we have an intimate relationship. Obedience is more about a relationship. And if we can get that right, obeying the same way St. Peter did will be easy, regardless of the opposition. God is not controlling. Sometimes we think God wants to control us, and that's why we have to obey. That's for us. If we obey... Like, God, he doesn't get anything. The blessings is for us, for our families, for our friends. So again, obedience isn't to a command. It's to a person. St. Peter, his obedience was to a person, and that's what we learn from him. The Son of God, who died for you and I, who loves us, who's went to the ext extreme to die for you and I. And that's the person who St. Peter was given, willing to give his life for. When we obey the person, when we obey God, our big God, life is not going to be easy, like we said. We will face opposition. But just as much as the enemy works hard, God works harder. Don't leave our blessings on the table because we refuse to obey. Because logically, it makes no sense. Everybody else is doing it. God is above logic. And finally, our obedience to God shows our trust and our faith and our big God. Glory be to God.